if you're building a fresh new Ryzen ITX gaming or workstation system, then you're probably tossing up between a B450 or X570 motherboard. The good news is, despite opting for ITX, you've still got a few really decent options out there, which won't be handicapping your powerful little system. The question is though, whether you do go for that X570 motherboard and do spend that extra money, or perhaps save a bit of cash and go for a B450 motherboard, and perhaps that'll get the job done just fine. To help us with that testing today, we do have the 16 core Ryzen 3950X, which will help us test the kind of worst case scenario in terms of power requirements and cooling. So while AMD expanding their mainstream AM4 socket to support up to 16 cores is a true blessing for those users building a compact workstation, you could potentially get a different experience depending on the board that you're using. Maybe the board you chose ends up running the CPU voltage higher than necessary. Maybe the VRM or chipset tends to be a bit toasty under load. These are the things that we're going to be testing today and diving into in this video. But before we dive into the testing, I want to take a very broad look at your current options when it comes to B450 and X570 ITX boards and pick out some of the general better options. So starting with B450, and here you've got four options. Now, if you're not going to be overclocking, or maybe you're just interested in a Ryzen 5 build for gaming, all of these builds have VRMs that will be fine under those workloads and power requirements. And when we start discussing overclocking and heavy workloads like rendering and encoding, that VRM becomes a pretty important set of hardware, as that's what channels all of that power to the CPU. So with that in mind, the MSI Gaming Plus AC has the the strongest VRM here, but the ASUS Strix isn't too far behind. Both run six true phases with integrated power stages for the vCore VRM. However, despite the MSI board having a stronger VRM, I do prefer the ROG Strix board overall. You get an additional M.2 slot, so one on the front and one on the rear. You get faster rear USB ports, a better audio codec, and also an additional four pin PWM fan header. It is around $25 more expensive at the time of filming, but those additional features are worth it in my opinion. Moving on to an overview of your X570 options, and it's interesting to take a look at the general spec bump here that you get over the B450i boards. The two most noteworthy upgrades are the much beefier VRM and the active onboard cooling, but we also have a rear I.O. which gets a decent overhaul, and on all of these boards we also have Wi-Fi 6 connectivity if you have the speeds for it. So the VRMs on all of these boards are capable of running a 16 core 3950X, but for argument's sake, the ROG Strix and Crosshair 8 Impact do have the strongest VRM in terms of total output. There, the CPU power is split over the larger number of power stages, and that means that the heat produced is dissipated over a larger area also. The Strix and the Crosshair 8 Impact are also the only two boards with active VRM cooling, whereas with the other boards, you'll just wanna make sure that you've got enough air flow over the motherboard. Do note that the Crosshair 8 Impact technically isn't an ITX board, but instead a DTX board, it does extend about an extra 30 millimeters vertically at the bottom. So on paper, the two ASUS ROG boards are the better options, but pricing does need to be considered here, seeing as these will no doubt be the more expensive options. So with that general overview, you've got a pretty good idea of what some of the better B450 and X570 ITX motherboards are out there. But the real question is whether you even bother with X570 in the first place, because it is so much more expensive than B450. I mean, we are talking about over a $100 difference comparing this board and this board. And with those price savings, you could potentially upgrade your GPU, but certainly upgrade your memory or storage and have a better performing system maybe overall. Probably the most vocal concern going with a B450 board instead of an X570 board now is whether that's going to support your upgrade path down the road. And the only real way to test that now is with the most powerful processor that we can, which is the 16 core 3950X. If this B450 board can potentially support that processor during heavy workloads, then you could save a decent 
decent chunk of money on your system. So let's jump right into the testing. I've tested all three of these boards in the N case M1, seeing as this is one of the fewer ITX cases that the Crosshair 8 Impact is compatible with. I'm using a 240mm NZXT Kraken X53 to cool the Ryzen 3950X, and the radiator fans are pulling air from the radiator and into the case. This means that in terms of VRM cooling and case airflow, this is pretty much as good as you're going to get for a small form factor case. Now the first difference that I came across between these boards was the memory kit. Now although the CL14 3200MHz memory kit was stable via just simply enabling XMP in the BIOS for the two X570 boards, I did have to raise the DRAM voltage from 1.35 volts to 1.45 volts to get it stable on the B450i board. Nothing major, still stable at a relatively safe voltage at the end of the day, but it does look like these two X570 boards will be better for memory overclocking. So first I just wanted to see how these motherboards behaved while idling on the desktop and not completing any tasks at all. So we've got the B450i Strix in orange, the X570i Strix in teal, and the X570 Crosshair 8 Impact in purple. There's not a whole lot to conclude here, seeing as true idle performance is a pretty hard thing to test, but overall the B450i board does look like it's slightly more sporadic. It's obviously handling some background tasks or processing towards the start of the data logging, but even after that, the voltage does seem to not be as level as the other two X570 boards. Again, this is a pretty hard thing to test for, but it is worth showing anyway. But what we really want to see is how these boards handle the Ryzen 3950X under an actual workload like Blender. So here we're rendering out a very high resolution scene for 30 minutes while both the CPU and the VRM heat up. Overall, the CPU temperature was fairly close between all three of the boards during the render. The B450i board actually ran the 3950X the coolest by a couple degrees, but this will make more sense in just a minute. Now, revealing the VRM thermals, we get some interesting results. Firstly, we see that the B450i Strix can run the 3950X fine, at least with the case and cooler that we're running here. VRM thermals top out at 70 degrees C after 30 minutes, and although that is getting fairly warm, there's nothing to be alarmed about. That is definitely fine for daily use. Having said that, if you're going to be using a different case and intend on starving your motherboard for airflow, you probably will run into some issues here. The X570 Crosshair 8 Impact runs 16 degrees cooler after 30 minutes, and the X570i Strix runs cooler again, topping out at just 50 degrees C. I will note that whereas the B450i Strix and X570 Impact have clearly labeled VRM sensors in hardware info, the X570i Strix doesn't. However, I'm pretty confident that VRM thermals are under the sensor temp9, but feel free to correct me down below if I am wrong. The reason that the X570i Strix runs a cooler VRM under load when compared to the more expensive X570 Impact can be found by looking at the lower V-Core. So with all boards set to auto, they all pull a fairly similar amount of voltage, but of course this does need the context of clock speeds. Each board here is running the latest respective BIOS version and is interesting to see the fairly different result in boost clock. If you're running a lot of sustained load like rendering or compression, the extra 100 megahertz or so on the impact board may make a difference. Of course, you could just manually overclock to that speed and beyond, but more on that in just a second. On the bright side, the B450i Strix has the 3950X just 23 megahertz slower on average than the more expensive X570 variant. Variant. The CPU package power shows the two X570 boards pulling a bit more on average, right up against that 142 watt power target for the 3950X. The B450i board still has a bit more room to run though, and although it's not taking full advantage of that power ceiling, again, it's only a hair slower than the X570i board when it comes to overall average clock speed. But let's go ahead and overclock that 3950X and see if that B450i board can still keep up. While we take a look at the CPU thermals first, I'll mention that all ASUS ROG boards that I've come across have a hard limit for the CPU cooler's fan curve, where if the CPU surpasses a certain temperature, it'll spin the fans up to 100%. This is extremely annoying and I can't believe this is still a thing. So that's the reason why we see that wave pattern for CPU thermals around that 75 degree mark. Also, I have left out the X570i Strix here as I wasn't confident in the VRM sensor used at the time. 
time. But for all useful purposes, we're putting a $150 B450i board against a $400 plus top of the line ROG impact board with the same overclocked 3950X. I've got to say the B450i board is definitely holding up. VRM thermals hover around the 80 degree C mark and although I'd probably recommend going with an X570i board at this point if you are planning on overclocking this CPU, this is just extra assurance that the B450i board can do it if needed. Another reason that you might want to go for an X570 board though is due to PCI Express 4.0. It does have a much higher bandwidth than 3.0 that you'll find on the B450 board and we do get a much higher read and write speed for our Gen 4 NVMe SSD as a result. Whether that extra speed is beneficial to you completely depends on your workflow. For most systems though, there probably isn't going to be a practical perceivable difference. Going into this testing, I'll be honest, I really wasn't sure if the B450i Strix could handle the 3950X. After all, this board wasn't built with the 3950X in mind, and at the time of its launch, the most power-hungry chip in AMD's lineup was the 8-core 2700X. So the bottom line is, if you have enough airflow in your case, the B450i Strix is good to go, even if you are using a 3950X. And that pretty much goes without saying that if you are using a Ryzen 5 3600 or a 3700X, this board is pretty much perfect and really should be at the top of your list for a mini ITX build. And as we've seen, there is no real reason that you wouldn't run this with a 3900X or 3950X given that airflow is adequate. But just to be clear, that doesn't mean that upgrading to the X570i Strix is pointless. The more robust VRM paired with the onboard cooling does make it the safer choice if the case that you're throwing it in doesn't have sufficient airflow across the board. For example, in sandwich layout cases like the Dan A4SFX or Ghost S1 where you might be using a liquid cooler, the X570i Strix would definitely be the more sensible choice there. And as for the crosshair impact, although I am a bit of a fanboy for the ROG Impact series, it's just not a sensible recommendation given that the Strix board has the same VRM and onboard cooling at a significantly lower cost. For the $100 plus over the Strix, you get features for LN2 overclocking, an onboard power button, a clear CMOS and flashback button at the rear, and a couple other features for extreme overclocking. The X570i Strix is stacked enough as it is though, and high-end builds with some sort of budget should get that instead over the much more expensive ROG Impact. So hopefully this was helpful to you guys planning out your powerful mini ITX Ryzen builds. And if you're interested in any of these motherboard recommendations, you can find them linked down below in the description. As always guys, a huge thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.